My name is Gary Shiner. I'm a certified diabetes educator from Philadelphia. And I've had type 1 diabetes for about 30 years. I'm also a, an ex, a master's level exercise physiologist, so it's sort of a, a specialty area of mine. Uh, I've always been involved in sports and exercise activities personally. Now look at me. I'm not real tall, bald, Jewish, wear glasses. What do you think my sport is? What do you think I'm really into? Expecting someone to say ping pong. But I'm a basketball guy. Do I look like I'm built for basketball? I don't look diabetic either, but that's, that's another story. Uh, managing blood sugars with sports and exercise may be the single greatest challenge we have to deal with with type 1 diabetes. And who here has a challenge they run into with their blood sugars when they exercise? Tell me, what happens? you get a delayed drop hours and hours later. You get low sugars while you exercise if you didn't think way ahead to make insulin adjustments. So you, let me get this. You're exercising and your sugar goes high. That's impossible. It's, okay, it's not impossible. What else? Any other challenges? All right, well, we got lows, we got highs, we got all kinds of issues. And it's important to manage blood sugars during sport and exercise because it affects our performance. You're not going to feel all that good if your sugar's high or low. You're not going to perform as well. You also put yourself and others at risk. So learning how to balance things, how to keep the blood sugars in range is a very valuable skill to have. You know, when I teach my clients, and I work mostly with type ones all over the country, and I don't emphasize complications a whole lot. I'm more into here and now. How does diabetes management affect us today? And this is one of the areas where it has a major, major impact. Glucoses are out of control. It's going to affect a person's strength. It affects stamina. It affects speed and agility. It affects flexibility. It influences our safety. Our mind is not functioning quite as well. We're slower. Uh, and it affects our mental sharpness. So think about whatever form of sport or exercise you enjoy and how much better you could perform in all of these areas with blood sugars that are in a healthier range. It really can make a big difference for you. So those are the things that I like to emphasize. The major challenge we have with type 1 diabetes is, is the risk of low blood sugar during exercise. We'll also talk about the highs, but the lows are our, probably our single biggest challenge. Now, who here does not have diabetes? You, sir. What's your name? You raised your hand to volunteer. What's your name? Antoine. Do you exercise? You work out? What do you do? Martial and I didn't mean anything by it. Antoine does martial arts and he's a big strong customer here, so be nice to him. When Antoine starts to do any form of exercise like martial arts, one of the first things that'll happen is that the insulin that his pancreas makes shuts down. He's not going to produce insulin for a period of time, or very, very little insulin, to put it that way. Another thing that happens is that hormonally, he produces adrenal-type hormones that help the body break down its energy stores. So the fuel that's stored in his liver, his muscles, is broken down to supply energy for his working muscles. So that combination of a sharp insulin reduction and glucose being released into the bloodstream helps prevent hypoglycemia. So Antoine, have you ever had low blood sugar doing martial arts? I'm glad you've never you said that because it would ruin my theory completely if you had. Yeah, anyone without diabetes should not experience hypoglycemia when they exercise. You can run a marathon. You're not going to get low blood sugar. So the body has all these mechanisms in place to prevent that. Who here has type 1? You got type one. What's your name? 
Sue, what's your favorite form of exercise? Pick one. Kickbox. Wow. Well, Antoine, Sue, we're going to have a battle royale later. When Sue starts to exercise, the insulin level doesn't suddenly drop. It doesn't have a significant reduction. When Sue gives her insulin, the basal, the bolus insulin doesn't matter. That insulin is going to be hanging around for quite a while. And she doesn't have the, the ability to telepathically tell her insulin molecules, okay, insulin, I want you to stop working now. It just doesn't work that way. So the insulin level is either unchanged, or if it's after a meal, the insulin level is going up quite a bit from a bolus that was taken. And when you have a lot of insulin in your system, it actually blocks those adrenal hormones from breaking down your body's fuel stores. So that combination of too much insulin, not enough sugar entering the bloodstream, can lead to hypoglycemia. So Sue, have you ever had low blood sugar while you exercise? Oh, yeah. Yeah, jump for the tablets. That's why low sugars develop. And it's the only difference between someone with and without diabetes is that very first step. It's that sharp insulin reduction. So when we think about how we go about preventing hypoglycemia, we're thinking about, well, how do we restore this balance that the body would normally have? How do we either provide a lot of extra glucose for the bloodstream, or how do we cut down on the insulin dramatically? And it really depends on the timing of the activity. Exercise that takes place after a meal, when mealtime insulin is surging, needs to be reduced. Cutting back, we call it, on, call it the bolus. We cut back on that mealtime bolus dramatically if you're going to exercise afterwards. The activity is going to take place before a meal. When there's not much bolus activity taking place, then we use rapid-acting carbs pre-workout to prevent a drop in the blood sugar. With long-term activities, things that last two hours or more, then we also can start thinking about things like basal insulin adjustment. We also think about regular snacks along the way if you're using that approach. And this applies not only to long periods of, of endurance exercise, but also yard work housework, shoveling snow. Be a little snow here in Detroit, I hear. Just a little. Yeah, so you might be out there several hours. Things like shopping or just walking long distances. These types of activities are burning glucose steadily, and if you don't make adjustments either to your basal insulin or replace those carbs with regular snacks, the blood sugar can wind up low. So just to get a few more specifics about this, there is no magic number or magic adjustment to make. It really depends on a lot of variables. What I usually start my clients out with is a 33% reduction in the bolus if activity is going to play, take place soon afterwards. 33% might work, might not, but you try it and you see what happens. If the glucose winds up high as a result, no, we cut back too much. Try 20% next time. If you wind up low, we didn't cut back enough. Try 50% next time. And when I say cut back on the, the meal dose, I mean the whole thing, the blood sugar dose and the food dose put together. So if you calculate your dose and it says take six, well, you cut it back to four. See what you get. You go exercise and afterwards measure. If your blood sugar's in range, ha, you hit the target. You got the magic number. Now, some activities, especially we call anaerobic, activities, things that involve a lot of quick bursts of movement, hot, very high intensity, short term things, can result in a blood sugar rise. So we don't always adjust insulin for those types of activities. But any form of aerobic, cardiovascular type of activity, you know, we start out with about a one third bolus reduction. What about the basal insulin? If you're on an insulin pump, you know, it's relatively easy to make basal insulin adjustments. However, the adjustment needs to be made ahead of time. When you change your basal insulin, it's going to affect the insulin in your bloodstream in the next one to four hours. It's not going to happen immediately. It's a gradual, long-term thing. So these adjustments need to be made one or two hours ahead of time 
in order to work effectively. We generally start with a 50% reduction in the basal and go from there. I find with more intense long-term activities like marathon running, high-speed cycling long distance, people often need a 70 or 80% reduction in their basal insulin. If you use an insulin pump, I'm sorry, if you're on injections, you can also cut back on the injected basal insulin, especially for day-long activity. So if you know that tomorrow you're going to be working in the yard all day, you could cut back on your Lantus or your Levomir tonight or tomorrow morning, or both. So if you take basal insulin twice a day, you may need to reduce both of them. Uh, but that works well for day-long activity for those on injections. If you're on injections and you're going to be exercising for just a few hours, I wouldn't bother. Because those insulins really last 24 hours or more. You don't want to you know, destroy your whole day's control just for a few hours in the middle. When we think about pump basal insulin, you got to remember that when the pump delivers basal, it's really delivering tiny boluses every couple of minutes. And when we add up all the peaks and valleys from those little mini boluses, that's what produces a flat level of insulin in the bloodstream. That's your basal insulin. So if you're going to exercise for a half an hour, I have a lot of people would say, well, I'll just disconnect from my pump or I'll suspend my pump while I exercise and that should take care of me. But will it? When you think about basal insulin and how it's delivered, if you eliminate those pulses of basal insulin for half an hour, the actual level of basal insulin in the bloodstream looks like this. There's hardly any change at all while you're exercising. So it will not save you from hypoglycemia. There's a bit more of a dip in the insulin level after the workout's over. And that can cause the blood sugar to rise post-workout. So this causes two problems. You can go low while you work out and then go high after. So this is not a reasonable approach. It's not going to work well. Well, what about two hours of exercise? Now, surely a two-hour disconnection or suspension is going to make a more significant difference. And yeah, it will. Again, it's going to cause some problems. Because at the beginning of the workout, and this is what the basal insulin in the bloodstream looks like when you disconnect for two hours, at the beginning of that two-hour session, probably for the first 30 to 45 minutes, there's very little change in the basal insulin level. So the glucose will tend to drop at the beginning of the workout. You see towards the end of that two-hour session how low the basal level gets. When there's virtually no insulin in the body, two bad things can happen. One is that the blood sugars can start to go up very high. And what else could happen? Anyone know? Ketones. You can start to produce ketones when your insulin gets dangerously low. So you got double the pro double problems by doing something like this. And this is why it's never a safe thing for, to disconnect for more than an hour at a time because you run into this kind of problem. A better approach, like I said, is a temporary basal adjustment. Cutting back on the basal 50, 60, 70 percent, whatever you need, starting one or two hours ahead of time. That's the approach that seems to work best for most people. It produces a level of basal in the body that it's closer to what you need. It's, there's less at the start, there's less in the middle, less at the end, and then it ramps right back up again. We usually discontinue or end that temp basal either right at the end of the workout or even a half an hour before so that the basal insulin will start to ratchet back up when the workout's over. So let's take an example and see what you guys would come up with. This is a guy who's playing lacrosse for two hours after dinner. He wears an insulin pump. Tell me one, raise your hand if you've got one idea on how he can prevent hypoglycemia. Decrease his meal bolus. Absolutely. The amount, eh, I don't know. We're just starting out for two hours of lacrosse and to practice. He's going to work harder than he does during a game. We might cut it in half and see what we get. That's an excellent suggestion. What else might he do? Cut what back a couple hours ahead? Basil. Yeah, since he's on a pump, 
we need less basal insulin during this workout as well. So the bolus is working, but it's also basal. And since it's a long workout, you probably need to make an adjustment to the basal. So what he ends up doing, he does cut his dinner bolus in half. He doesn't wear the pump while he plays. What he does is clever. He gives a small bolus before he disconnects. He, disconnect, he reconnects at the halfway point of the practice, gives a small bolus, and then another one at the end. So he's kind of replacing his basal insulin with little boluses, and he doesn't have to wear the pump at all while he's practicing. These guys are running left, right, getting big sticks and balls chucked at them. He just doesn't want the pump on, which I can understand. This works well. And he also checks his blood at the midway point and has some rapid acting carbs. I think he uses Gatorade if his sugar is below a certain level. If he's getting down under 140 or so, he has the Gatorade to make sure he's good to get through practice. Let's talk a little bit about the snacking. Again, we use carbs to prevent hypoglycemia. The idea is not to wait until you're low and then eat them. So if you're going to use carbohydrate as a way to prevent a hypoglycemic episode, eat them ahead of time. Don't wait until a low takes place. The carbs should be eaten before the exercise starts. The amount of carbohydrate is going to vary based on a lot of variables. Certainly the bigger you are, the more carb you need. The harder the workout, the more energy you burn, the more carb you need. It's also going to vary based on what your blood sugar is. If your glucose is a little high or rising, you need less carb. If you're low or dropping, you're going to need more. Now, how would you know what direction your blood sugar is headed? Look at, yeah, you can look at a continuous glucose monitor. That's one of the great things about CGM. It tells you, it doesn't just tell you where you're at, it tells you where you're going. That's so helpful. There's a big difference between a 150 that's stable and a 150 that's dropping quickly. You know, the way we interpret that, we can make smarter decisions if we know where we're headed. So that's a great tool to have. Um, during prolonged activities, it's also going to be necessary to snack on a regular basis. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. The kind of things we snack on to prevent a low should digest as quickly as possible. We don't want food sitting in the stomach over periods of time. We want it getting into the intestines and into the bloodstream. So can someone give me an example of a rapidly digesting snack? Juice yeah, generally works pretty well. What else? A rapidly digesting snack. Granola bars actually tend to take a lot longer to digest, especially if they have some fat in them. Yeah, glucose tablets, anything with dextrose in it, like Smarties, Sweet Tarts, Nerds, Runs, those are all you know, very rapidly digesting. Applesauce pouches, yeah, I suppose you could use that. Interesting, whole fruit does take a little longer because it's got a lot of fiber in it. Uh, but a good example, sports drinks work well, regular soda would work well, uh, dry cereal, crackers, pretzels, this kind of stuff digests very rapidly. So it's not going to just sit in the stomach waiting for the workout to end. It'll be digesting during the exercise. So there's also the question, is it, if you're going to do a long workout, is it better to have one big mega snack at the beginning or to have mini snacks along the way? The mega snack will drive your blood sugar up considerably, and then it just plummets throughout. You might pass through your target blood sugar zone for a short while, but you're not going to spend a lot of time in your blood sugar happy zone. The smaller, more frequent snacks help you stay within your target zone, which helps with your performance. So it's always better to have the smaller, more frequent snacks. Years and years ago, the very first marathon runner I worked with uh, got into the habit of, of carrying jelly beans with her. When she was doing her distance runs, she'd wear a fanny pack, she'd fill it with jelly beans, and she'd pop a couple of jelly beans every half mile, and it maintained her beautifully. The problem is she sounded like a rattlesnake everywhere she went. So it was a little bit scary. She'd go, <laughs> everywhere she was running. 
This is a chart that's just a, a small example of how much carbohydrate is needed for different forms of exercise. And this is showing for 60 minutes of activity, the carbohydrate required to get through the activity with a fairly stable blood sugar. So somebody who weighs 200 pounds and is swimming is going to need you know, 90 grams of carb for an hour of swimming as opposed to you know, a 50 year old kid who's dancing or doing gymnastics only needs about 10 grams. So there's a, a big divergence in the amount of fuel that's needed. My book Think Like a Pancreas has a nice big size chart with about 40 different sports activities with all of these listed. And I believe John Walsh's Pumping Insulin book has a similar chart in it as well. Now, I mentioned before, it's not just exercise that'll make the sugars drop, it's also just daily activities. It's you know, the housework, yard work, snow shoveling, things like that. So keep those in mind as well. Any long activity working in the yard, sugar is gonna drop. You're gonna need fuel to replace that, or you're gonna need to cut back on your insulin. So let's look at this next example. This is an 85-year-old girl who plays tennis after school. So who thinks she should cut back on her lunch bolus if she's got tennis after school? Yeah, I wouldn't cut the lunch bolus. This is taking place in three hours, four hours after lunch. The lunch bolus is gone by that point. We don't need to drive her sugar high all afternoon. You know, school after lunch is boring enough. You don't need to have high sugar making you tired also. So normal dose at lunch. So what she does is she uses carbs to keep her blood sugar in range when she plays. She figures for an hour of tennis, she needs about 30 grams. And she increases that if she's a little low, takes less if she's high. And then if she's going to play past an hour, she has another 20 grams of carb just to keep her going and keep her sugar stable. So if you apply those strategies, if you adjust your insulin accordingly, if you have just the right amount of carb for, for your exercise, you should be in range every time, right? No? But this is textbook stuff, isn't it? This is diabetes we're talking about. Nothing's the same two days in a row. We all know that. And when it comes to blood sugars and exercise, there are a number of variables that can start to influence things, such as how much insulin you have working in your body. If you took insulin earlier within the last several hours and you still have a decent amount working, it's going to lower your blood sugar more than if there's no insulin on board at the time. Also, where the insulin was given. If your pump site or your injection site is near a muscle, that is going to be very active after the insulin is given, that insulin will absorb and work harder than if it was given in a different area. So that's just something to think about. What was eaten and when it was eaten? If you just ate something that's slow to digest, you know, it's pasta, something with berries or some dairy product, the carbs from that might take hours to work. Whereas if uh, you had something very rapidly digesting, it'll help offset the blood sugar decline during the exercise, and you might not see as much of a drop. Your emotional state can have an effect. If you're relaxed, feel good, the sugar's going to drop more than if you're uptight, angry, upset, or in a highly competitive state. The temperature and humidity has an effect. It's amazing. The temperature here varies by 50 degrees within a single day. You know, the hotter it is and the more humid it is, the more your body has to work the blood sugar will drop more under those conditions. Colder, drier conditions, you won't see as much of a drop as you do in warm, humid conditions. A person's familiarity with the activity also has an effect. This is what we call a training effect. And this happens at the beginning of any sports season. You're likely to see blood sugars drop more when you start an exercise for the first time or the first time in a while than if you've been doing it for a while. Uh, Everyone here, I'm sure, has taken an aerobics class at some point in their life. Think about the first time you took that aerobics class. Everyone in the class is going like this, and you're going like this. It, you don't know the routine, and your body is working ten times harder than it has to. By the end of that class, you can't even stand. You're so tired. But if you stick with it and you learn the routine, you're not as exhausted at the end. So there is a conditioning, a training effect that occurs. 
the more familiar you are with the activity, the less of a drop you'll see. So, for example, beginning of a, any anytime you take on a new sport or beginning of a season, you'll probably see more of a drop at the beginning of the season than you will at the end, even doing the same things. If you've been very active previously, your sugar will drop more than if you've been inactive because you, your body is set up to be very sensitive to the insulin you're taking. And you know, obviously the nature of the workout. The more muscles you're using, the harder you're working them, and the longer, the greater the glucose drop is likely to be. But we, then we also have this other challenge, which is called delayed onset hypoglycemia. I think everybody here probably has experienced that at some point with a hard workout and blood sugar is dropping hours later, just out of the blue. Now the reason this happens is because our muscles store sugar in a form called glycogen. It's a compact form of sugar. And with, in, with really hard workouts, kind of workouts where you are just totally spent at the end, you've probably depleted most or all of those glycogen stores. So after the workout is over, the muscles are grabbing sugar out of the bloodstream to replace that stuff. And that's why the glucose drops hours later. The key to this is being able to predict it. Again, this doesn't tend to happen with a 30-minute workout. It's going to be longer, more intense kinds of exercise. If you can predict this sort of thing, you can prevent this thing from happening. So if you know your sugar is going to drop six hours after you do a 90-minute class of some kind, you can take steps to prevent it. You can certainly lower your basal insulin if you use a pump. Or if you're on injections, you may be able to cut your basal if the timing is just right. You can have snacks that you don't take insulin to cover. You can cut back on your insulin doses a little bit. Your meals and snacks following those kind of workouts, you could take a little bit less insulin. If you use snacks to prevent this, this is where we want to use more of the slow digesting carbohydrates. Things like yogurt, ice cream nuts, those kind of things work well because they, they take their time. They raise the blood sugar gradually over a period of time. Now raise your hand if you think exercise can make blood sugars go up. You're absolutely wrong. Physical activity doesn't create glucose. It always contributes to a drop in blood sugar. But the thing is, we don't live in a vacuum. When we have diabetes, there are a lot of variables going on at the same time. Even though the exercise may be lowering the blood sugar, you may be producing enough adrenal hormones that raise you more. And that's why blood sugars can sometimes rise with certain forms of exercise, you know, particularly you know, these high adrenaline activities. If you lift weights and you do high weight, low rep type lifting, probably going to see a rise in the blood sugar. If you're doing 20 reps with lower weights, you don't tend to see that happen. Uh, if you're doing sprints, you're likely to see this happen. They're short duration, all out kind of things. Sports where it's mostly short bursts of movement. Uh, baseball and softball are like that. Golf is like that. Martial arts is often like that as well. If you're being judged or scored in your performance, dance competition, gymnastics. Uh, also, if the competition is the major thing, if winning is the objective, there's a tendency for blood sugars to go up. And this is why on a practice day and a game day, you might see completely different blood sugar responses. But just like with the delayed lows, if you can predict it, you can prevent it. That's, that's the key. If you know your glucose is going to go up, you can do something about it. What do you think your pancreas would do if it was working? If your blood sugar was going up, how would your pancreas respond? It would make more insulin. So that's what you need to do. Now, it sounds contradictory a bit, but it works. It's what your body needs. Now, your doctor will never agree to this because he's always afraid of getting sued for something. But the fact is this works. This is what the body needs under these conditions. You have to figure out, though, when it's going to happen. It needs to be a predictable phenomenon. So if you know that every time you've got a soccer game, your sugars are going up 100 points, you can give extra insulin preemptively to prevent that rise. 
the insulin would need to be given about a half an hour ahead of time. And if you know you're going to rise 100 points, I would give enough to offset a 50-point rise. Give half the insulin you normally would need to offset that rise. So I'll give you an example. This is a young lady who's playing basketball. Her sugar goes up 200 points when she has a game. So she knows, well, her correction factor is 50. She's not going to give enough to offset a full 200-point rise. She'll give enough to offset 100 points and see how that goes. So she would give two units since her correction factor is 50. If her blood sugar is high before the game, she'll cover that, again, with half the usual amount. Remember, when we're exercising, insulin works more effectively. Giving half the usual dose will accomplish the same thing. So she's covering the high with half the usual amount and the anticipated rise with half the amount. And she checks her blood along the way and makes sure it's working fine. I've never had a patient have any problems with low blood sugar doing this. It's a safe thing to do. Now, there's also the question of, is there a blood sugar at which it's dangerous to exercise? Is there a high reading that's too high? What would you say to that? Is there a blood sugar above which you shouldn't exercise? Is anyone worried about exercising above a certain number? Yeah, if they tell you, give you numbers like 240, 250, 300, you know, we, we live with numbers like that day in and day out. The, other, the truth is there's no such number. You can exercise with high blood sugar safely. It will affect your performance. Granted, you'll be a bit dehydrated, your energy level will be down. But there's nothing dangerous about exercising with high sugar. What you will need to do is hydrate. You'll need lots and lots of water. And you will need to give insulin to start bringing that blood sugar down. And a little hint, a secret I'll tell you, if you want to get the sugar down fast, inject the insulin directly into a muscle. It stings for about a second, but the insulin works twice as fast when it's given into a muscle. The exception is if you have ketones. This is an important differentiator. A high sugar without ketones, it's not dangerous to exercise. The presence of ketones is a whole different story. The presence of ketones means that your body is completely out of insulin or you're developing a pretty significant infection. In either case, you should not exercise. You're going to need to give insulin drink and really wait that out. Hmm. Well, but if you have key, if you have high blood sugar and ketones, if you're on a pump, you have to inject your insulin at that point and change your site. We'll talk, we talk more about it later. All right, so to prevent this issue of, of high sugars becoming that much worse, I would recommend check for ketones if you have an unexplained high reading. We all have highs, so we know why they're high. But if you've got a high reading with no clear reason, then you ought to check for ketones because there may be something going on that you're not aware of. If you've got ketones, obviously do not exercise. You need to get insulin and fluids right away. There are a couple of blood glucose meters that measure ketones. It's a much better way to measure ketones than with a urine sample. Ketones will show up on a blood sample instantly. It takes hours for blood ketones to start spilling into the urine. And the Precision Extra from Abbott and the Novamax Plus from Nova Medical both have ketone strips that go in the meter and will give you an exact ketone measurement at that point in time. Like we talked about before, don't disconnect from a pump for more than 60 to 90 minutes. You're going to run into problems. You have options for wearing a pump during exercise. Like the guy I showed you before, he just boluses every hour. You can reconnect hourly and bolus a portion of your basal to replace it. But in most cases, you can wear a pump with almost any form of exercise. There are a few, few exceptions here and there. But we've got five companies now that do nothing but make pump accessories. So you can usually find something to use to keep the pump secured and safe while you're wearing it. 
So bottom line, I mean, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Uh, if you can manage your blood sugars during sport and exercise, you can do anything. Uh, and if you think things through enough, it's, it's certainly doable. You know, diabetes, at this point, it's a lot of mental anguish, a lot of mental energy we have to expend. We can't just eat lunch. We have to count the carbs in the lunch, calculate an insulin, or check our blood, calculate an insulin dose and administer it, then we get to eat lunch. You know, if you're going to exercise, play a sport, you have to think about you know, replacing your fuel, you have to think about how's this going to influence my blood sugar, what adjustments do I have to make. It's a thought process, it's, it's mental energy we have to expend. Until we have a cure, we've got to expend that mental energy. You know, if we don't, our glucose is going to be out of range and it's going to affect us today. I'm just not going to perform as well. But hopefully you have some better tools to be able to manage uh, sugars better with exercise now.